Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Michael Brenner, who is the CEO of Marketing Insider Group and co-author of the best-selling book, The Content Formula. Michael is recognized by Forbes as one of the top CMO influencers in the country, as well as a top social media marketer. He's also recognized from Dunn and Bradstreet as a top B2B marketer, and Michael has also been on the list of the top 50 most influential content marketers in the country. And today, we are going to be talking about the biggest trends in content marketing for 2017. So telling uh, by his bio, I think everybody should pay attention because Michael knows his content marketing. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Doing excellent. Doing excellent. Jazzed about digging into content marketing with you. Uh, cool. As you know, we, uh, we we have a big emphasis on it here, and uh, there's not one of the better people in the country to learn from, so I hope everybody really pays attention here because Michael uh, truly is one of the best in the business, and uh, I know he has great insight, not only currently what's going on, but what to expect in the future. So, mm -hmm. Michael, just to uh, start to dig into everything, uh, what do you feel that, um, before we get into uh, the future, what do you feel is the current state of content marketing right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, to sort of like uh, State of the Union, um, you know, refer to this question, I think the state of content marketing is pretty strong. Um, you know, it, it, modern content marketing, I think, is just about seven years old, and a lot of people point to American Express Open Forum as probably one of the, you know, earliest examples of modern content marketing. Um, it took a while, I think probably another two or three years for other companies to really learn from their example. Um, myself included when I was at SAP, you know, building our, our first content marketing platform. And, you know, I got to say those early days were a real struggle. It, you know, one, we had to explain content marketing. Two, uh, executives were still trying to figure out what social media was. Um, you know, along comes another trend. And, and then, you know, three, there just there wasn't a lot of other people nodding their heads in the room when we were having, you know, these kind of conversations. And I think a lot of that has changed, right? People are totally comfortable now. Everyone understands that you've got to distribute content and be where your audience is on social. I think most companies are starting to realize that you have to create content that, that helps buyers um, as opposed to just creating content that promotes your business. Um, and now we're starting to see, you know, I don't know if it's an age thing, but I think we're just starting to see more, um, more, let's say, you know, modern marketers kind of uh, um, sitting in the rooms that are, that are, you know, understanding the need to break through the clutter, um, to break through the resistance we have with ads and promotion and to, and to create, you know, or invest in uh, content marketing that can drive value for customers and, and can drive measurable value back for the brand. Okay, so you're still feeling uh, everything's still rocking and rolling with the uh, current state of, of you know this this form of marketing that really kind of paints a, a huge broad stroke across it. But um, in, in regards to the content marketing and marketing with value added articles, blogs, videos, podcasts, interactive content, what have you, you you're you're still feeling that it, it, it's a very strong strong way and um, to, to market yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at even a bigger trend, is this, essentially there's a shift happening um, that started with digital marketing. We started to see brands shifting out of traditional methods and into more digital forms. And what they found was that those were just as ineffective when they started to be able to measure them as the older forms of promotional marketing. So you think about paid, owned, and earned. I think, you know, even the largest consumer brands are starting to put significant amounts of shift in their investment into owned content marketing platforms. And so I'm, you know, totally bullish that that's going to continue um, because, you know, every, every, every technique and every, every tactic can be measured now. Um, and if it, it can't be measured, I, I really question whether it should be done at all. And so, you know, what's happening is brands are going to continue to put investment. We're going to continue to see momentum uh, behind this shift into content marketing, um, you know, own digital marketing platforms overall, with, uh, with earned media, you know, sort of did people like and share this as, you know, at least a short-term proxy for success. Gotcha. Now, what, describe what you mean by owned. Yeah, so uh, when people talk about paid, owned, and earned, um, owned media properties would be, as simple as I can explain it, uh, your corporate website. You own mm -hmm. that property. No one can come and take your traffic away from you. Um, that would be a great example of an owned media property. When you think about mm -hmm. earned media, Earned media would be, um, let's say, your um, uh, the likes and tweets 
and, and shares that you get in social, not just on your own branded accounts, but also the things that are happening organically from your audience. So that would be earned media. Most people traditionally think of earned media as PR mentions, but now essentially social media is a, is a you know, digital modern form of PR mentions. Um, and then paid media is all the stuff that you pay uh, a, another publisher um, or media property in order to interrupt their audience's content experiences with a, you know, usually it's in the form of an ad. And so banner ads are paid, TV ads are paid, um, billboards on the side of, you know, the interstate are paid ads. And so that's the distinction between paid, owned, and earned. Gotcha. And, and to just circle back what you said and for the listeners here, Michael, strongly suggesting that, you know, the trend has been and will continue to be is to build your own platform. Get, get that, you know, blog page on your site, you know, get your YouTube channel going, get a podcast station going, but your platform so you can control it and you don't get the rug pulled out from under you with a new Facebook algorithm, which seems to happen almost every other day these days. So that's, right. that, that's, that's basically what you're saying. Okay, cool. All right. Now, what are some of the biggest challenges brands, um, you know, brands, companies, um, marketers are facing with content marketing these days, in your opinion? Yeah, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think we continue to see, um, I, I'm going to point to two main challenges. One is I think we continue to see um, the natural, in, I call it the natural instinct of the business to want to promote itself. And so, I think it's important to understand that it is natural to want to do that. It's when you're a parent and you have a baby and you take a picture of your beautiful little baby, you want to post it on Facebook because we love our children. And as business, as business executives and managers and leaders, we love our products and we love our customers as well. And so it's natural that we want to promote ourselves and what we do and why we're better and why people choose us. That's the natural instinct of the business. However, those are the kinds of techniques and tactics that we as consumers tune out. And so the, the, the main challenge that, that marketers are continuing to face in content marketing, um, I think now most of marketers, most marketers get the fact that you can't just do paid promotion. You can't just interrupt content experiences. We need to have some investment in content marketing. But when you get to the sales leadership, you know, especially in like B2B or even CMOs on the B2C side whose base of power is really in their ad budget. Then you start to see these challenges come forth. Like, you know, if you think about Budweiser, what does Budweiser spend on paid ads versus content marketing? And it's, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but I would, I would be shocked if they spent as much as 1% of their total marketing budget on content marketing. I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that if, you know, just based on what I see as a consumer, that they're spending a ton of money on interruptive experiential. I know they call it experiential, but it's basically, Interrupting content experiences to try to to try to push a message of hey drink our beer because it'll make you you know it'll make girls like you more you know I mean mm -hmm. basically that's what they're trying to do and so that natural tendency is the biggest challenge still today in content marketing the natural tendency for companies to want to promote themselves when promotion is the thing that turns us off as consumers mm -hmm. so that's number, and, that's number one yeah okay no no go ahead go ahead. No, I've got a, I got a second one. If you want to, if you, if you want to react. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, one, to touch, ahead. to touch, yeah, to touch on that point. You know, some people might look at Budweiser and like, well, shoot, they're huge. It's working for them. Well, well don't forget, they've had you know, a hundred years to to get to get in the position where they are. But there are companies that you might have heard of, like Marriott. That um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. I believe it is Marriott that is huge on content marketing. Mm -hmm. That is a big right. brand that has turned that direction. And mm -hmm. does not just say, hey, we have great this or, you know, of course they have, a, you know, programs where, you know, they reward, you know, the rewards programs. That's a different subject, very important. Mm -hmm. But they have turned their marketing to huge on content marketing, and it has paid off just huge dividends to mm -hmm. them. So don't yeah. think that, you know, like, oh, Budweiser didn't do it. I don't need to do it. But look, look at some of these other big brands that have seen the light, and it works great. You know, even the ones that have had a huge name, they're, they're, they're really starting to separate themselves. So, um, yeah, let's hear point number two. Yeah, and then I think the second thing, and, and you know, and I don't, want to, I don't mean to pick on Budweiser, but, um, you know, I can, I can imagine this conversation happening inside Budweiser as well. The second main challenge we still face as, uh, as marketers and especially as marketers who are trying to push the, the benefits and the return that you can see from content marketing is the campaign-based mentality. 
And mm-hmm. what I mean by that, and, and I, I actually had like a, um, a pretty heated discussion with somebody on Twitter a couple of weeks ago um, about, you know, the reason we spend money on paid search ads is because we don't rank organically. And, you know, I made, I made like, a, I think I had a blog post that had that quote in it. Somebody retweeted it. And then this guy basically came after me, you know, with a big stick. And essentially his point was, okay, I sort of understand what you're saying, except paid search produces results tomorrow. And SEO or, you know, earning sort of attention without, you know, getting to an organic um, search result that might be, you know, in the first page or whatever takes time. And, you know, he was essentially arguing for my point. And my point was that we only spend money on paid interruptive techniques in campaign-based functions because we're looking for a short-term bump. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so the campaign mentality uh, I think is, re- is really challenging content marketers uh, because content marketing really requires a commitment, even a small, you know, I think even a small, it's kind of like your 401K, even a small investment consistently over time produces a compounding rate of return. Campaigns, mm-hmm. campaigns number one, often don't produce any return. <laughs> and number mm-hmm. two, if they do produce a return, which, you know, many do, and there's a lot of good marketers out there doing great stuff and you know, with a campaign-based approach, but they are never compounding. When the money stops, the results end. There is no compounding return potential of any campaign. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and so, you know, I think that's the second greatest challenge that we face with um, with uh, content marketing. Just com- just coming to that understanding, yeah, and I, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I you know I definitely see that because it's just. You don't have, I mean, humans are wired for immediate gratification, especially exactly. especially it's only getting worse these days, right? So mm-hmm. you've got to fight that. You, you have to get past the point of return, I guess, and go, go yeah. ahead and use that if you like. But you've got to get past the point of return where you actually start to see it, but then you're – just you've built a brick house um, and right. you're, you're solid, but you got to get there and you got to commit to it. And uh, yeah. yeah, you're not the only person I've heard that from. I've heard from people like Joe Polizzi saying the same thing: is like, hey, the biggest problem people face is they quit. They quit yeah. right before it starts to work, That's right. and you That's know, around right. that four month thing. Because you hear that all the time. Yeah, I'll try it for three or four months. Well, I think you need to say, well, don't try, because then it won't work. So That's right. m- moving on. What about you say seven or eight years, you know, new or old for for this industry, but I, I think we all have seen as marketers, you know, because uh, content marketing has gotten the air from a lot of people, and but what the pos- potential negative result of that is a potential saturation or oversaturation of content out there on the web. So what what is your opinion on that, and then how can a company, you know, it, well, let's just talk about your opinion on that, then I'll get into some questions. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I mean, first I want to pay some respect to my my uh, my friend and colleague Mark Schaefer who wrote about content shock and and um, you know I sort of disagreed with Mark at first and and I think you know he disagreed with my reaction and I think we've come to a common understanding of each other's points of view which is always a good thing. Um, content shock was basically Mark's uh, defense of of the position you just you just mentioned and it's it's a fact, right? The, the fact is that as more brands, as more, as more bloggers, as more consumers are creating content, there is a saturation element happening. And, and I think what Mark's point, uh, the point Mark was trying to make was that the, the, the return on any one piece of content um, is going to continue to decrease to a potential point of, of you know, of diminishing return. And, and so that's, it's, you know, it's an inarguable point. It's an absolute fact. And so, um, you know, so I give Mark credit for, for, for pointing this out and, and having us all think intelligently, I think, about what that means. Um, and, and we'll get to that. We'll get to my, what, what I think is the, the, um, uh, the sort of net effect of that in, in, as we talk about predictions for 2017. But, um, but I think what, you know, the one thing that the, 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 the reaction that I had with Mark was that having lived inside a brand, you know, a company as big as SAP, there is so much money being wasted on content that is, it, it's either never used or when it's used, it's just such crap that no one looks at it. That mm-hmm. in my mind, in my mind, there's an infinite opportunity, an endless opportunity to improve when you look at the investment and the resources 
that go into creating such crappy content inside corporate marketing departments. Mm -hmm. And so while if you think about it from a universe perspective, yes, there are tons of content being created today, and it will only get um, you, you know, get worse, if you will. I guess it's really not a bad thing in my mind, but, but there will continue to be more content created, and it will continue to be harder to break through the noise. And yet, <laughs> I think when you look in the perspective of the content that we create, the investments we make as corporate marketers in content, there's a vast, endless opportunity for improvement. And so I think these two notions, you, you need to be able to hold both of them in your head because it's just really two different perspectives. Um, and so maybe what that means is, you know, brands almost need to get exponentially better at creating better content, right? So they need to create more and they need to create better content at the same time. That's a really difficult thing for a lot of companies, and yet companies that commit to content marketing are making that happen, and they're showing results. They're showing increasing results over time. Well, that's, yeah, I guess that that uh, kind of answers the question I was going to, you know, ask about that. If there is an over, you know, a concern about an oversaturation of content, is how can a company that wants to still apply content marketing deal with this issue? And basically, the the answer is, you know, just make sure you're doing a bang up job of it. Don't put crap mm -hmm. out there like everybody else. And the fact that a lot of people are putting crap out there, that's where you see the opportunity to stand out from them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the, the point I always make, and I, and I love making this with CMOs, is that however bad you think the content your team creates is, double or triple it. Because it, it, every time we've looked, every CMO that I've worked with has, has been shocked at the amount of waste that happens in their content production um, investments in just inside the marketing department. Just forget customer service and sales enablement and all kinds of product marketing areas. Just inside the marketing department and communications areas itself, the amount of terrible content um, is, is always underestimated by, sales, by marketing leaders. And so just start with, yeah, I, I get it. There, it's hard to break through the noise, but let's, you know, fix your own house, right? Like clean up your own house. Get, look at the investments you're making and just commit to creating better content in a measurable way, in a consistent fashion, with a real investment. And the brands that do that, are, they're breaking through the noise. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, cool. Well, all right. Let, let's start moving towards the future now. Yeah. What, what are some of the biggest trends you see in uh, specialization, visualization, and personalization? Yeah, and you so, can so, take one at a time if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. So I think the first one is just a great segue from that last one. And so um, so let's say that, that brands have, you know, created efficient content marketing operations. And so they're now efficiently, you know, you can't always create a great piece of content, but they're continuously improving, and they've created sort of a process and a machine that gets to, let's say, agile or, or just more efficient content creation. So let's assume they've fixed that problem. And let's also assume that, you know, Mark Schaefer's absolutely right, because he is, that content um, saturation is a problem in the, in the marketplace. Um, what I think the, the, the prediction I have for the future, and I'm the, not the only one to bring this up, but... The prediction I have for this is specialization, and what I mean by that is every financial service company could say that they want to be an authority on providing their audience with the best financial education possible through their content. Well, the problem is that not every financial service company can be the premier authority in financial education. And so, you know, Wells Fargo needs to have a different approach than Bank of America and a different approach than, um, you know, Chase. And so each of these brands are going to need to find – a way to specialize, and I'm not talking about unique point of view. I, I often tell my clients that there's a unique point of view trap because the unique point of view trap is all about you as a brand. Um, brands need to focus on how they can be uniquely valuable, and that's what specialization all, is all about. It means I can provide a unique value to my audience because of the things that make us unique, because of the things that sort of drove us to, you know, to start the companies they started, and that specialization, that uniqueness, is going to translate into unique value for an audience. And so essentially what you're going to see is instead of banks just committing to being experts in financial education, they're going to be experts in a specific kind of financial education, or they're going to be experts in a, to a specific audience, like maybe younger professionals or, you know, um, working moms or, you know, families of six or more kids or whatever. You know, you can probably, you know, you can, you can come up with examples all day long. But specialization is absolutely the answer to the content saturation problem. Gotcha. So fi find your niche, find out what you're really good at, and then go for that. 
Don't don't yeah, be was, I, everything to all people. Yeah, and I would say it, it's important. There's a nuance. It's important to think of it from the customer's point of view. It's not what are we the best at because a lot of company mission statements are like, hey, we're the leading provider of blah, 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 and nobody mm-hmm. cares, right? But, yeah. but think about how does that translate to value that is perceived by your audience? Um, and, you know, like I always say, a lot of companies find their niche by going back to their founding story. Marriott has done that very well by, by going back to their founding story and realizing that, that um, Marriott was founded with this whole idea of, hey, we want you to feel like you're coming home. It's about hospitality and the feeling of feeling like you're at home and a consistent experience wherever you are in the world. And, and so they, they start, they're starting to tell stories that are really unique to them based on that feeling. And it sounds kind of generic, but they're actually uniquely positioned to be able to tell that story for a number of different reasons. And so that's, you know, just one example of, of ways that, you know, you can start to see that happen. Mm-hmm. And, and somebody else could have done that if Marriott didn't do it. So, you know, it's not that they're just uniquely positioned to do that. They did it, right? Exactly. And, exactly and if they didn't right. do it, somebody else could have gotten to them. All right, That's let's right. move on to uh, visualization. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this one's almost so obvious it, it, it doesn't even bear repeating, but I think um, I think most like, like folks like us on the, on the agency and consulting side, I think we sometimes um, underestimate how really complex organizations are that we serve, and, and so um, it's obvious that we need to create more and better visual content. The, the generation coming after millennials, my, my daughter's generation, um, I saw a stat that something like 95 to 99% of the content that they interact with is visual. It's an image, it's a video, it's a GIF, um, it's an emoticon, whatever emoji, whatever visual sort of uh, content you can imagine. And so uh, brands are gonna need to figure this out, and they're gonna need to figure it out quickly because it's, it's becoming so important to the audiences and generations that are coming into the marketplace, into the workforce. Um, the, the reason that I think we underestimate the complexity of brands is that, you know, visual content is a little bit, it's, it's not, you know, you could pretty much hire, you know, freelancers, uh, you know, they're, they're a dime a dozen. I mean, they're all over the world. There's plenty of people that can write articles for, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents a word that aren't actually that bad. Um, you can get quality content for a relatively low price. You cannot fake your way to, to quality visual content. You can't fake a great infographic. You can't fake um, a, uh, an effective video or, um, uh, you know, even design, design around longer form content, uh, even images. Something as simple as image selection for written pieces of content, really, really important, much more expensive, like three, four, ten, a hundred times more expensive than than written content or text-based content, and and I think it's something that uh, brands are going to need to figure out in 2017. All right, so put that at the top of the list, everyone, visual, videos, you know, and, and just down to, if you do have written contact, just make sure it looks good, package it right. Yep. And people yep. do judge books by their cover, and that will never change. Um, right. Personalization, is that, do you yeah, kind I, of, I, I, it sounds like that might connect to, Specialization, but maybe a little bit different. Why don't you dig into that? Yeah, so personalization, I think, is an extension of um, – it, it's, it, it's a little bit further, uh, more mature down this, the life cycle of content in that, um, you know, imagine a world where there's maturity in content marketing. All brands are creating effective content. Um, they have specialized into a niche. They have visualized with, you know, really compelling uh, visual types of content. Um, the next question really is how do you make yourself truly uniquely valuable to your audience? Um, and, and I think one way to do that is to deliver highly personalized content. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, I read Business Insider every single day. And the reason I do, I don't go to their website. I subscribe to, I think, two or three of their newsletters. And, um, and they use a technology called Sale Through. Sale Through uh, identifies the content that I interact with in both the newsletter and on their website when I, when I, when I do land there. Um, and it offers me a totally personalized individual newsletter every single day based on some of the recent stories that they've published. So if you and I both subscribe to that newsletter, you would get a different one than I would based on your track, you know, your click history um, and track record with consuming content on their website. And so it's really fascinating to me how good they are at serving me stuff. And, and you know, it's, uh, um, <laughs> it's really interesting, too, because uh, my wife is also a subscriber, and it's, it's pretty fun for us sometimes to, to say, hey, I, you know, which article did you get today on Business Insider Newsletter? Because it's totally different. And, um, and, and it sometimes is, is interesting and even funny to see how well they're able to predict the things that we're interested in. 
Um, so that's just one example of how companies, I think, can begin to personalize content experiences. So, so it starts with you have to be able to create, you know, decent content. It's got to be um, customer focused. It's got to be um, readable and shareable and visual and and uniquely valuable to your audience. Then we're going to start to see in 2017 companies starting to move to figure out how do we solve this personalization problem? How do we get the right content um, or our best content to the people that want it most? Gotcha. And, and I hope um, she didn't peer over your shoulder and see that they were serving you behind the scenes of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm a much bigger geek than that. It's usually more things like uh, – <laughs> Like uh, Game of Thrones trailers and uh, <laughs> Star Wars uh, predictions for future movies and um, you know things like that. But yeah, sure. it, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> but, well, but yeah, I mean, you need to have a yeah. We need to have a separate whole podcast on just discussing Game of Thrones, but the, that's another right. time. That's right. um, winter, winter is here. Winter is here. Oh, it's too long. I don't know if you heard, <laughs> but it's pushed back to yeah. to the winter of next year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kills me. But. Yep. Um, Okay, now how do they do that though? I, I mean, I mean that that sounds amazing. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I want to do that. That 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 sounds fantastic. But how, how yeah. does a company like that go about serving that personalized content? I mean, I, I assume it's a pretty intricate. You know, maybe there are. You know, is it a software they can use, or how mm -hmm. does that work? Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of different um, technologies. In fact, I, you know, part of me, if I had more time in the day or weeks to come is thinking about doing a whole sort of series on how to implement personalization. I, I just wrote sort of a summary article earlier this week about personalization, but I, it is a, it's a really good question, and it's a good, it's a good how-to question. Um, I'll answer it in a couple of different ways. Number one, I think it's important to understand that there are still three main ways that we all as consumers discover content. It's search, social, and email. And so there, there are entire companies who exist only as email service providers, and, and the skim is a great example. All they do is email out cool stuff um, to, a, to a broad audience. But they, all they have is an email list and, and content that they, that they curate and cover um, in their own perspective, and, and that's what's drawn people to them. So email, search, and social. Um, with social, right, so it's, it's pretty much, um, you know, you're trying to gain access to, uh, to your audience's audience through the interests that you share, I think it's pretty difficult to personalize through social because you don't own, you know, we can't, in, we can't influence Facebook's, Twitter's, Snapchat's algorithms. When you, so when you get to search, now it starts to get interesting because if somebody types in, let's say, um, content marketing agencies, and, and let's say hopefully they find your, yours and mine, right, on, it's somewhere on that list, and they click on it um, through simple uh, technologies like Adobe Test and Target, or um, I know Monetate has a platform, SAP bought Hybris, which does this for e-commerce companies. Um, there are other platforms as well that do this, OneSpot, Video. Um, there's a number of technologies where they can serve up a piece of content that's, if not totally personalized, it's at least somewhat intelligent. And so it may know what browser you're using, it may know what company you're from because of your IP address, it may know what region of the country you're in, I think if you go to Monetate's website and says, you know, good morning, Michael, uh, it's, it's 98 degrees in, in Philadelphia, um, you know, go, go get a glass of lemonade or something. Like they do something like that where at least it feels somewhat personalized, even though it's, they don't really know who you are. So, yeah. so that's, that's how, you know, and those technologies have been around for quite a while. I, I used it when I was at SAP probably, you know, four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, now, now what we're seeing is, we're seeing those per those technologies follow you around the web, and I'm sure you've seen this. Is you know you, you search you, you search for a pair of shoes, and then you see that pair of shoes on 75 websites uh, in banner ads. You know they're they they've got a cookie, they're tracking you, and they're serving you content. Companies like One One Spot, who I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, and a beta tester for their platform, they're serving up banner ad content um, that isn't always in the form of, a, of an ad. It's often um, mapped to where they think you are in the buyer journey. So it might be a blog article or a white paper relevant to what they think um, uh, stage of the buyer journey you're in. So, so companies like OneSpot are doing a great job of doing that wherever you go on the web. So that's gotcha. search, right? So we, so we covered search, social, and then the, the final one is email. And, um, and I think my sales for example is a great, great you know, example there of a technology that every company could use in their newsletter for their list 
to learn how to serve the right kind of content to people based on their interests. Even if you don't know anything other than their email address, just knowing what they've clicked on and consumed and shared, um, you can serve highly personalized types of content experiences. Very cool. And I'd like to throw in one thing on the uh, social part. Uh, something that uh, you can do is you can put pixels on specific pages, you know, mm -hmm. i.e. like a specific article. And then you could build audiences based on that. And then you can make sure when somebody's you know lands or you know on that page fires up that pixel and then you have it in queue they'll get served this this piece of article this piece of content so that, that is right. another way another way you can um, you know in regards to your advice on personalization you're not necessarily saying say hey Dave but you're just saying hey whomever you know mm -hmm. we've recognized that you like this sort of thing here's another this sort of thing to look at and that's right. you know you that's start right. to build that so that's that's another thing now um what about like um what have you seen out there uh you know this kind of goes along the way you know combines a couple of things that you've been mentioning about you know some ways that you can break break out of the oversaturation you know with some really cool things uh and this combines that with like your visual visualization but like interactive content um, you know that that's a, a very good way to kind of really interact <laughs> with your uh, with your audiences. W what have you seen? What are some good? You know, what are some companies that are doing that the right way? Do you have you seen any any cool examples out there like that uh, with, with interactive content? Well, I mean, I think some of the simplest examples are BuzzFeed, which Disney Princess are using type um, articles. You know, and so um, that that kind of interactive content has, you know, and there's a few other viral examples like that. Um, where, you know, you're taking someone's response to a simple question and, and, you know, in some cases it may be more or less serious, and then you're providing some, some interesting insights uh, to them based on that. I think, you know, simple quizzes uh, are probably the easiest form of interactive content that you can get to. Uh, there are other companies I know when I was at NewsCred, we worked with a company called Seros, uh, C-E-R-O-S, actually an old colleague of mine from SAP is one of their uh, marketing folks. and. Um, you know, Theros does a great job of doing interactive visual platforms. So talking about visual and interactive, um, they do a great job and did like a visual storytelling um, platform for NewsCred, which, uh, which did, did really, really well in, in conjunction with Getty Images. Um, so there are a few good examples out there. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think interactive content is just a great way to create, well, and, and, and of course we can't go through, I, I was hoping that Snapchat would never come up in this conversation. But uh, I, I'm done with hoping Snapchat doesn't come up because we now need to all talk about Pokemon Go, right? So if we're going to talk about interactive content experiences, right, Pokemon Go taking over the world uh, through, you know, through this interactive, immersive, uh, almost virtual reality type experience. So, you know, what does this mean for the future of content marketers? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's the same answer I gave to the what does Snapchat mean for content marketers, and it's, you know, I, I just, you know, it's, I'm still trying to figure it out. I think, um, you know, I think the future is going to be a really interesting place uh, for all of us in marketing. Um, and part of that, as Ann Hanley loves to say, is that because marketing is life. It's, you know, it's basically marketing is now, it's no longer just ads and, and interruption. It's the content we consume. Um, it's the way that uh, it, it's, you know, brands who are all invested uh, in supporting media companies and the content that get created. Um, it doesn't get created without without brand and marketing investment. So marketing is life. Yeah. No, I hear you. Hey, apparently, I need to look into this Pokemon Go. <laughs> it was, I just did a podcast a couple hours ago with Stefan Spencer, who you know wrote the art of SEO, and he he went on about something going on with the Pokemon Go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that. <laughs> just not, it's gonna be it's uh, not, not in my wheelhouse, but I I, I, I I'll, I'll put it in there. Um, yeah, that that's also now. Can you? We we talked about this, but uh, I always like to give people examples because it helps with you know theories and uh, understanding of what you're saying. Can you point to someone doing visu uh, visualization really well that you'd like to show people to hey go check them out or check that company out? Anyone on the top of your head? You know, doing they're doing a really good job. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it, it's a little bit obvious, but a company called Rithia, which is a, a video content uh, platform. Um, is doing a great job of, of using videos to tell, help people understand how to how to create better videos. So it's a very I always yeah. say it's a very meta it's a very meta meta but a very simple sort of example of well if you're a video company you probably should know how to create good video 
And if you do, then why do you use those ex that expertise? It's actually a great example of, of, of specialization and visualization because they're, um, you know, they're, they're using what they know best and what they uniquely know best to create the, a specific kind of content to help their people create that specific kind of content. So Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A.com. Wistia does a great job. No. They, have a, they have a great video on how do you shoot um, a high-quality video with an iPhone 5 or 6. It's pretty cool. No, I mean, I mean, Michael, I mean, yeah, I mean, just because you gave, you know, an idea that you think a lot of people might already know about, I, I promise you they don't. So mm -hmm. that's, um, yeah, no, that's that's great. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, send somebody, send, send them somewhere to say, hey, check, check them out. They're doing a, an yeah. awesome job about that. Yep. Um, all right, what about tying in marketing automation with content marketing? Yeah. What, what do you see, uh, you know, these days and, and moving forward in regards to that? Yeah, there's, you know, the, the marketing technology landscape is an interesting, you know, I've been in it for, um, gosh, about 10 years, um, specifically marketing technology for almost, yeah, it's about 10 years. And um, one of the things that I think, I, I don't know if you're a fan of, um, of the uh, Silicon Valley show on HBO. Sure. But, um, you know, there was a lot of talk about an episode, I think about two or three weeks ago back, where they talked about the great secret of startups, of Silicon Valley startups. And the great secret is it's not how many users you have, it's how many active daily users you have. Um, and I think there's, there's you know, there's, a, a, I think, a relative consensus around the fact that, that there's a little bit of a bubble in marketing technology. So that's just kind of a – that's my, my uh, poorly um, – poorly described economic and financial investment advice for, for your audience. But, but in general, what I think is happening is marketing automation is a pretty proven um, must-have technology tool set for marketers. In the same mm -hmm. way that CRM, that CRM was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, in the same way that data visualization is, I think, today as well. Um, and so, you know, companies rush to chase this shiny object when marketing technology markets were pretty hot, and, and Marketo and HubSpot and Eloqua certainly, you know, have all three companies have done a great job of creating, a, I think, a product that people are finding really, really compelling and useful. The second those things got implemented, there was a huge need for an, under, for, for, and an understanding um, pointing to the gap in content. And so I, I'm thrilled that marketing automation has reached the saturation. Well, it's probably not a saturation point, but it's reached the maturity that it has in the marketing landscape because it's just pointing out and solidifying the gap that most brands have in creating content mapped to the buyer journey. What do I mean by that? Um, when I do training, and I, and I did something, I think uh, I pointed to this in the, in the last webinar I did for you guys, that for every one piece of promotional content, you need to have 10 pieces of middle stage content and 100 pieces of early stage content. And almost, almost I don't think there's a single brand I've ever d uh, looked at done a content audit for that came anywhere close to that ratio. So for every one piece of, of, you know, brochure or feature copy, you need to have 10 middle stage offers like white paper downloads and events and webcasts, and webinars. And for every, for every 10 of those, you need 100 early stage pieces of content. No brand is creating that, and marketing automation is pointing out that gap. So I'm, hey, I love it. I, I was at the Marketo User Summit a couple of uh, months ago, and I found the content marketing conversation there almost more mature than the, the ones happening at content marketing conferences because these are people that feel the pain every day of the gap in content. Mm -hmm. and, and they can obviously use these programs to ping people when they might score certain, you know, on a certain page or, or dropped off the page or, and, and then you plug in good pieces of content to, to ping people that way. Is that kind of how you see it, or do you have some other advice on, on how to use these automated programs with the content marketing in mind? No, I think, I mean, I think the point of marketing automation is to, is to drive higher conversions from one lead stage to another, right? It's really that simple. And so, it, 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 you know, what's been great about marketing automation is it's forced marketers to think across the buyer journey and to mm -hmm. put the buyer almost at the center. Now, marketing automation mm -hmm. is the technology or the tool set that enables you to nurture your customers depending on prospects, depending on what stage they're in. Once you know what stage they're in, then you've got to offer up the right piece of content that's going to drive them or, or at least educate them so that they can, they can move on to the next stage. And so that's why I love marketing automation. We, we're all looking at the buyer journey, trying to map content to the buyer journey. Marketing automation is a tool that helps you get there, 
but it's also been great for content marketing because it's pointing to the gaps that exist largely in the early and the middle stages. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Um, I always ask this question uh, for all the all the experts out there. Uh, is the because it's always a huge question for everybody. Is when should a company start to see success with content marketing if you're starting from from scratch? And does it differ between like a B two B and B two C company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the answer is, um, I think it's four months, one week, and three days. I think that's... Uh, that I'm, uh, you yeah, nailed no, it. That's uh, what everyone's saying. That's what everyone's saying. Exactly. Four months, one week, and three days, of course. Exactly. <laughs> yes. um, uh, no, it, you know, there is, you know, I always say there's this sort of, you can call it the, the valley of darkness or the leap of faith. There is a period of time where I think for most companies, there's going to be a lack of results despite a, an investment that's taking place. It's just, you know, it's just the nature of building an, a financial asset. You have to invest capital in order to build the asset before you can start to see the results of it, right? And that's why, that's why marketers love campaigns, because they don't have to think about that, right? They, they, you know, they're addicted to the drug. They throw some money at Google paid search ads, and they get, you know, they get leads, and, and you know, call it, call it a day. Um, there, there is always going to be sort of a period of time. And that's, just, mm -hmm. that's what happens when you make the right kind of strategic investments in anything, whether it's an, a factory or an employee or a content marketing platform. Um, mm -hmm. what, I, what we've seen is that, in general, Google starts to think of you as an authority to take, take seriously when you're consistently publishing content after about four months. And so I, I made that number up a little bit. But, but that's what I've seen, and, and I've looked at this trend across – probably 30 different companies. After about four months, there starts to ha have this, uh, you start to see this organic search and even in many cases social traction that takes place after about four to five months. And so mm -hmm. what, what I tell most marketers is, you know, take a, take a pulse check at six months. Give yourself, like, and request the ability to test and pilot a program for at least six months because it can take that long for you to see really any kind of measurable um, let's say, quantifiable results. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, having said that, and I'm trying to set expectations somewhat low, most of the companies I work with um, see results almost immediately. And, and I'll give you one example. I, I built a – I won't tell you who the company is, but I built a, um, a uh, sponsored, off-domain, um, unbranded content marketing program for a very large enterprise software company that was struggling to gain uh, trial sign-ups for a new application they developed. And so, you know, on like something like May 6th, I think we launched the website um, on, you know, sort of uh, providing helpful tips and tricks on the topic that they thought was interesting for their audience. Um, within four weeks, not four months, but within four weeks, that site had become a top ten provider of traffic and sign-ups for that, for that product. This is a very large, like, one of the largest companies in the world, and within four weeks, and this little tiny investment in a content marketing program had, had, had entered into the top ten of all traffic and lead sources for new sign-ups. So it can happen really quickly if you do the right thing, if you're set up the right way, if you've got the right strategy in place, um, and you're committed. And so, yeah, so that's what I would say. I would say, think, you know, hold six months in your mind. Heck, if you can ask for 12, even better. And then try mm -hmm. to beat, you know, try to try to beat that, um, that sort of, uh, you know, when the clock starts, uh, you know, feel the pressure of trying to beat that timing. But, but um, that's what we, that's what I see. Gotcha. And I think some of it comes down to how long the buying cycle is. You know, if it, if it's a longer buying cycle, it's going to take a longer time. And if it's a shorter buying cycle, um, it should take a shorter amount of time. But yeah, it, it varies. And in what you mentioned about, you know, Google and social taking you seriously that's the beginning but then you know mm -hmm. then then the leads come and then the sales come after that so yeah that that um i think that kind of paints a, a good picture for people if they're able to invest in that much time and, and energy and money to, to give it a go but we've just heard from countless and countless and countless people that it works you just got to stick mm -hmm. with it and do it all right yeah. to, to close here give me one just off the wall crazy prediction for marketing in 2017, yeah. anything, anything crazy. Um, so, the, well, I think that um, 
and I considered writing this book, and then I thought that it's it's in some ways so obvious that it's not even worth saying. But but it is a somewhat crazy prediction in certain circles, and and the prediction I have is that um, I think we're going to see the death of ads. I really do. I think that that at some point in the future we won't see ads. And what I mean by that, and the reason behind that is, there's a publisher who I won't mention whose site when I land on it throws so much interruption and BS in front of me that I'm, I hate them, number one, but I hate the brands that, that, that are interrupting me with their ads even more because they're so stupid to think that, that what they're doing is actually going to influence me. Number one, I'm not a potential prospect for them anyway, so it, it, their stupidity is showing through, and, I, and I'm being a little harsh here, but, but my point is that I think that I'm not alone in the frustration I feel when my, when my content gets interrupted. And so if marketers are smart, and I believe that we are, and we follow the data to what works, and I believe we will, and we start to see not just the negative impact or, or the lack of impact of our, of our advertising investments, but the negative impact of advertising investments, the only conclusion I think you can have is that, that we're going to see a radical shift in the way marketers spend their dollars. Mm -hmm. Away from ads, and and what it may look like is it might it, we might go back to you know P and G soap operas. We might see hey, a, a soap opera sponsored by P and G, commercial free, right? There there are TV uh, media companies that are already going back to that model, and and you know PBS has been using that model with uh, with you know sort of um, in a nonprofit way for a long time. But I think that's what we're going to start to see, and we're going to start to see that happen. I think a lot quicker than the ad agencies might uh, might be thinking. Mm -hmm. And when you say death of ads, I mean it's still you know, a good practice to retarget people who land on your site, but you want to retarget them with something of value, which ties into the content marketing. Like, hey, if you have any, you know, if you're a tech company, you know, here, here are some risks you need to worry about. I mean, you're, you're not saying to get rid of that. You're just saying change the message to, to a value because you still got to get in front of people, right? Yeah, there, you know, there's a great – yeah, there's a great study from the University of Stockholm that was done just a few months ago. It was published, and it's, like, super geeky and techy, um, and it's almost difficult to read like a lot of, you know, sort of academic papers are. But what this thing said was there were two main conclusions. Number one, the n amount of money that a company spends on advertising has no direct correlation to their brand, the, the, the value of their company, no, no correlation whatsoever. However, they did find a correlation to companies that advertise with what they called um, advertising equity, and they defined advertising equity as communications that are relevant and helpful. And so I've never seen anything relevant or helpful from Budweiser. No, you know, again, not to pick on one brand. We could pick on, we could name probably 30. Um, uh, I'll but, tweet you know, Budweiser. I'm tweeting Budweiser after this. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is that, you know, it's, yes, so, so retargeting relevant and helpful content provided even in an ad or interruptive format is, is I think, going to always be there. It's the, it's the opposite of that, irrelevant, unhelpful, purely selfish and self-serving types of ad interruptions, I think, are, are going to start to decrease in a rapid way. Gotcha. Well, Michael, appreciate your time and your insight. It, it's, uh, I, I know it's always helpful for me, and I, and I know it's going to be helpful for everyone else out there. It, it, it's been awesome hearing from you here. How, how can people continue to follow you? Yeah, I would, I would be uh, honored and thrilled if anyone wants to reach out to me on Twitter, at Brenner Michael. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Just type, uh, type my name in there. You should find me. Uh, and you can find me on my website, marketinginsidergroup.com. I'd love you to subscribe and check out some of the articles that you see there. Hopefully you'll find that I, I sort of preach, uh, you know, sort of follow what I preach or take my own medicine or eat my own dog food or whatever analogy you want to use that um, I don't, you know, really I try not to promote and just be helpful. Awesome. And for the listeners, uh, it's at B-R-E-N-N-E-R-M-I-C-H-A-E-L, Brenner Michael. All right, Michael, Till next time, uh, looking forward to it. Thank you for your Thanks time. Thanks so much, David. Yep, take All care. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye.